Good afternoon. Um, my name is Amber Heard, and I have to say again, I am so honored and thrilled uh, that I received this invitation uh, to speak at the 2018 One Young World Summit uh, here at The Hague. Uh, I feel very honored. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. What a great crowd to be surrounded by. Thank you. When I learned that uh, One Young World uh, is a global forum uh, for young leaders trying to work together to collaborate in solving the world's most pressi pressing issues, I obviously leapt at the opportunity to be involved. Um, that's why I'm here today. I would like to take a moment to explain just how I wound up here today. Uh, as I'm sure every single soul in this room uh, has an incredibly unique story uh, that has led you uh, down the journey that puts you in the seat you're in today. Um, I also have to say there is a common element, a common thread that runs through all of our stories. It is the fact that we have all recognized and understood the importance of our shared humanity and the vital need to preserve and protect that humanity. And we can only do this by fighting for the fundamental rights inherent to every human being on this planet, regardless of religion, nationality, creed, code, color, religion, gender, or sexuality. All humans. When it comes down to it, it's about fairness. Even a child understands basic injustice, right from wrong. I grew up uh, near the border of Mexico in Texas as a daughter of a construction worker uh, who I watched toil underneath the blazing hot, <laughs> unforgiving Texas sun uh, alongside a labor force uh, of, made up almost entirely of migrants. They lived in our home. They are part of our family. I considered them family, my friends. And when we would cross across the border, as we often did into Mexico, it was on the return and crossing back that this grave injustice hit me. It was the impossible to ignore injustice that allowed me the freedom to travel back in both directions that was not afforded to my Latino counterparts on the other side of the border. Those people that I considered friends, family. And I would look out, I remember driving in a, from the comfort of the back seat of my dad's old pickup truck it's not very comfortable. Uh, and I would look out over this vast, harsh uh, terrain of Texas, this unforgiving, um, brutal terrain that hosts thousands of migrants who try to cross in, in order, in desperate uh, attempt. Uh, that they would be able to find for themselves a life uh, slightly better, a life slightly better for their families, um, one that wasn't just better, but livable. It left this indelible mark on me at a very early age that due to the accidental geography of my birth, I was awarded with some cosmic privilege that many, in fact, hundreds and hundreds die every year just for a chance at. Unsurprisingly, that sort of mark doesn't leave you, no matter where you live or what you become. When I got to LA, I started working with Amnesty International, um, where they asked me to accompany them on some research missions 
uh, to the border, the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, where I was meant to serve as uh, a spokesperson, really to audit, and then later serve as a sp spokesperson on behalf of the reforms uh, they were intending on presenting before the Supreme Court based on uh, a long-standing legacy of human rights abuse abuses. And um, due to immigration enforcement and policy around it. And despite the fact that I was meant to merely observe and then later uh, use my platform to draw attention to this um, issue and these causes, on that trip, my role quickly started to change. As a woman who grew up uh, speaking Spanish, particularly Spanish spoken by the labor working class, um, the class of individuals with whom I shared a home, a life, a friendship, a childhood, a niñeza. Um, it quickly became apparent to my team that despite their training, sensitivity, and expertise, they were having a fundamental difficulty in getting through uh, to people who were the subject of our research missions the people who needed it the most. Um, they were having a hard time getting people to open up and, 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 and share their stories. Now, having survived the traumatic and grueling journey every step of the way that led them to the place where they find themselves sitting in front of me, us, um, you can understand they were less than forthcoming uh, in trusting yet another stranger, looking different from them, speaking differently from them, uh, coming up to them and asking them questions in an official capacity, in a vest and a badge and a uniform. And what they found, what we found, is the women simply wouldn't speak to us or them. Um, they just wouldn't speak. And so my role was accidentally born. Uh, as I would speak to women in my Norteño accent, uh, I found after speaking to one, they would bring over their sister or their friend, and uh, more and more women would come to me, every single one, bearing the physical and, and veritable psychological, physical markings, evidence of abuse, Wearing that on their faces, I quickly learned uh, that me, as a woman, with my Norteño accents, was someone that they felt slightly more comfortable in speaking to. Meaning I <laughs> became the de facto translator and story collector on these trips. I would listen to their stories, and one by one, be introduced to yet another woman who would in turn share hers. And I would listen to their stories of incredible trauma, resilience, bravery, desperation, and hope. And one thing that I would ask, knowing the futility and the frustrating awareness of the futility of this question, but a question that I could not, not ask as a human being. What can I do? Me, what, what do you need? I had limited access to some water, some, some, some heat blankets, um, but I would ask, and knowing the futility of asking, what can I do? What do you need? And the thing that breaks my heart and haunts me and gives me hope is that that response was never, not once, one for money or independent gain, financial assistance, justice, retribution, immigration help. You know what it was? baby formula. I'm speaking to women who aren't necessarily nursing a child. 
and they're asking me for baby formula. Not just because the ones, the many that were traveling would risk their lives and even harder risk the lives of their children for a mere shot at a livable life, a livable existence. And the ones that weren't even holding a child for whom they could not produce nourishment themselves because of the lack of nutrients they had themselves, they were asking because if it wasn't for them, they were traveling with a sister, a friend, there was a woman in their group, and that was worth their one, one request would be to help her out. And that is something that never leaves you. It is the undeniable, indelible imprint of humanity. It is that common thread. And that is what I found on my most recent trip uh, to the largest Syrian refugee camp in Jordan, um, where I went on a metal, medical mission with SAMS. And I noticed that same relentless, uh, incredible, tireless fight for hope, fight for life. The first day I was there, I met this young Syrian girl named Wiam who was dying from uh, a blood disorder that needs lifelong treatment, treatment that she, her family obviously could not afford under the budget allotted to them through the Jordanian government in the refugee camp. And uh, I remember she was rece receiving medication and based on the work of SAMS, which is the organization I went uh, on this medical mission with, uh, they were providing her with basic medication in order to alleviate some of her symptoms as she's dying and knows she's dying and with through yellow eyes and yellow teeth and yellow skin she looks at me and she smiles and thanked me for the hug I gave her and for the time I gave her and for the as she said the look of hope or something that crossed her dad's face for that moment she said I 10-year-old girl said, I haven't seen my dad have that look in his face, knowing I can't cure her condition, and I can't change the system that put her there. But there is something in between the space of her eyes and her smile and the eyes of her father where I knew that I decided the almost negligible amount by Western standards was not a price too, pay, too high to pay for the life and the future of Weam. It is in the fight in a little girl like Weam to live another day in some of the world's most appalling conditions that reminds me of what it is to be human, to have the fortitude and hope in life, not just because it is easy, but despite the fact that it isn't. It is moments like that where I'm in the hospital speaking to refugees who've lost everything. I'm in their homes and they have nothing and they're offering me food or tea. It's in those moments where they express generosity, gratitude, fortitude, resilience, and a fight and a will to live where I see not discouragement or disillusionment, I see hope and encouragement. It reminds me of what it is to be human, what it is to share that common thread. Issues of peace and justice can easily become tied up in abstract policy and, uh, and po political debates. But my volunteer activism, working directly with those in need and those simply looking for a better life or for safety, for a chance that their families could have it better or they could have it slightly better, I've come to understand that our common humanity compels me, demands me to do all that I can do, all that I can do to fight to protect the dignity and human rights of everyone, no matter what border you find yourself behind. I have learned from conversations with mothers at the border, if you're a parent, you will do whatever it takes to protect your child. And me as a person, I can't ignore, I will do whatever it takes to fight for them too. Most of us here, most of us young leaders, will also do what it takes to protect our fellow human. Be it fighting cruel family separations at the border in my own country or, or rescuing migrants at sea in, Euro in Europe or near Europe, 
We all do what we can and we need to do all that we can. We only wish that our governments could do more and we need to demand that they do. I'll say one thing and I'll wrap up my very long speech. The media has a crucial role to play in the promotion of human rights and dignity and calling attention to the blight of those seeking safety. I believe we need a vigorous and free press endowed with courage and protection to do their jobs without fear of punishments and threats. All people must be guaranteed and need the right to know what's happening in their government. A free press informs us about why people are compelled to flee their homes with little more than the clothes on their backs. A free press serves as a watchdog and in far too many places around the globe is one of the only few checks on government, my own included. And sadly, a free press faces too many threats in today's global society, some being the threat of violence, incarceration, outright kidnapping and murder of journalists by governments and powerful individuals who do not like having the transparent light the media provides shone upon them. Uh, a group I work closely with, the ACLU, advocates that when, when press freedom is harmed, it is much harder to hold our government accountable when it missteps or overreaches. And they're absolutely correct. Less formally, perhaps even more importantly and powerfully, people today are using social media platforms to report injustice and wrongdoings by government, corrupt businesses, and individuals. Social media platforms can and do give a voice, a face, and a story to those stories desperately need to be, that need to be desperately told. It also allows for the marginalized to have a voice and put their leaders on notice. That they are being watched and they're being held accountable. Those who serve in the role as a, a member of the community, citizen journalist, may do so at significant risk to themselves, their livelihoods, their careers, and to that of those around them. But that is also why we must continue to support organizations like the ACLU in my country, many other organizations working across the globe, and why we must have faith in the courage of the young, of the one young world, to take on these important challenges and change it yourselves. I believe countries across the globe must do better and must do better as we as a global ambassadors and active voices in a global community, you as young leaders of today can keep the pressure on and compel our governments to respect the rights and needs of all our global inhabitants. There's a famous quote uh, from Mahatma Gandhi that springs to mind when I say this. A true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. In a world of wash and violence and suffering, those words are as true today as they, are, as they were when they were first spoken. So thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here and share some of my experiences with you today. <laughs>